So today I'm talking to Nat Martin. Hi, Nat. Hello. Welcome. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good to speak to good. you. Good. And yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, Thanks. still here, as I say. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's all good. So, traditional first question is, what do you do? What do I do? Well, I am um, a live um, performance musician um, and also I'm a teacher as well. Um, and I suppose there's other things I do along the way, but those are those are kind of the two main things that I'm up to currently. Um, so what I do, what I normally do now is I like to sort of obviously it's really about a chat about you generally because the whole thing about this podcast is about people's creativity. So it's really like um, an exploration about what makes people sort of creative. And so one of the things I've I've sort of been interested in is, you know, like how early the that sort of thing about music appears in, in people's lives or, or, you know, not just music, you know, art or, or you know, interest in acting or writing, you know, depending on what a person's mm. skill is. So what's your sort of earliest sort of recollections of, uh, you know, music or just generally stuff, you know, that you'd sort of go, yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess it was pretty, pretty early on, really. I mean, I mean, the f the first thing that springs to mind for me was that I I started having piano lessons when I was six, but I'm I actually play guitar. That's my main instrument, and um, mm. yeah, most of what I learned on piano I've completely really forgotten to be honest. But um, yeah, I had piano lessons from six, and then I started playing guitar at nine. But I think um, I don't know. I uh, I suppose I came from. I kind of came from a musical family, so my sister's also a musician. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, and my dad was an Anglican priest, so there was always kind of music of some sort that we were involved mm. with, and both my parents were were kind of into music. So, so I guess yeah, from a from a young age, I was kind of always around music. But I guess I first showed an interest in kind of picking it up at the age of six when I when I started learning piano, and then. Um, I kind of, yeah, didn't really get my teeth into that, probably because I, I don't know, maybe just my age. And then uh, when I started um, uh, secondary school, at, um, I, I then got into into guitar. So so it was pretty early on, I guess, for me that I, um, you know, perhaps not as early as some, but uh, certainly fairly early that I first got, got into music. Mm. So you were saying that your sister's a musician. What does she play? Yeah, so, well, she's a singer and also um, a piano player, which is kind of how I ended up having lessons because sh she was having them and she she kind of stuck at it, obviously, whereas I didn't, I switched to guitar. But um, And then she plays flute as well. Right. So, uh, so this is interesting, really, isn't it? Because you're saying that, <laughs> you know, the, your fa the, the sort of family background, if you like, you know, the, the sort of environment that you grow up in music is is just there because I, I think one of the things that i've always found interesting it's not so much that people are forced to do something it's just almost like if there are things lying around the house as a kid that just becomes normal to you so you would pick them up and play or you'd, you'd hear music and and you know you'd be you'd be drawn to it instead of it being being like no now you're going to do you know piano lessons or you know what i mean from from, from like nothing I think that's quite an interesting point, really. So, um, did you find that you naturally gravitated to guitar once you picked that up? I th yeah, I think so. I think so. So I, I think I, I'm trying to think what it was that sort of um, made me move towards it in the first place. I think so. I rem actually I remember we had a we had a kind of old knackered out violin in the house. Um, that um, I think my dad was sort of holding on to in the in the vain hope that it had some sort of value, but <laughs> I think it probably um, ended up in the skip. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, um, but it, it sort of had like uh, you know only two out of the four strings on it and stuff. But I remember again very early on, always picking that up and kind of 
trying to strum it like a guitar. So yeah, and I, I, and I, I don't really know what the where I kind of got that from, to be honest. But mm. but yeah, I definitely clicked with the guitar in a way I didn't with the piano. I think um, I think probably the classic thing is that I sort of enjoyed it more, and therefore mm. I stuck at it for that reason. That some yeah something in me clicked with it and um and I think I was always into kind of uh we had family friends who were musicians and so they would show me things from time to time and um I got into blues very early and um I think with the guitar being such a prominent instrument in that genre it um it kind of I think that helped (laughs) that helped enthuse me so yes yeah 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 yeah. I you know because I've interviewed few people recently who I'd sort of I've actually taught you know um mm. and and it's interesting because I don't remember what I did if you see what I mean I mean when they yeah. tell me it's a bit like yeah yeah I can sort of remember that now but um but a couple of them have actually sort of mentioned the fact that I put them on to sort of blues players like BB King and, and Freddie mm. King um and and of course, because it, it's like a language, you know, it's that sort of thing, isn't it? Once you, once you lock onto that, and because it, it seeps through into everything. So once you've got, once you've got that sort of vocabulary, even if it's just in your head, not necessarily in your fingers, yeah, it starts to make sense of so much more um, playing in other other genres because obviously it's the influence of those other things. You know? so, so that's interesting. Totally. That, yeah, I mean, because yeah. I don't, I mean, that might have been quite unusual for you at that age to be into the blues. I guess, yeah, sort of um, nine-year-old kid from Swindon <laughs> into yeah. the blues, yeah, I suppose. Um, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, what, what, what sort of period of time are we talking about? Um, What you mean in terms of uh, what Years. year? So, yeah. yeah, so, well, I was born in 82 and... um. So that, yeah, but then we moved. I moved to Somerset when I was eight. So that would have been 1990, and it was basically right after that that I picked up guitar. So that's quite. That's not exactly the time of the blues boom, is it? Really? I mean, it's, there's a few. You know what I mean? There's a few players out there, but it's not really prominent from that period of time. Whereas it probably exactly. was more so when I was learning, actually. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, so what? What was your influences then? So, yeah, I mean, it made me think of something when you said that, actually. So it, it was quite funny, I guess, the time I came to it, because I so I ended up getting into, I mean, a couple of the guys you mentioned there, BB, not so much Freddie King early on, more latterly with Freddie King, but Albert Collins, um, mm. BB King, um, Robert Cray. Uh, yeah, yeah, also, yeah. OK, that, that was prominent at that time, Robert Cray. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Those kind of those sort of 80s blues guys. And also Stevie Ray, who yeah, yeah. probably... Probably, um, I was massively into him uh, uh, for a long time, and I mean, still am. But I sort of, I uh, I tried to move my playing in other directions because I wanted to try and sound more like myself, even though I didn't really yeah, know yeah, what yeah. that was at, at yeah, the time. But um, but funnily enough, yeah, he probably, I think he probably died like a month before I started playing guitar. But I, I was so massively into him because I think it was it nineteen ninety or ninety one he died. I think it was ninety. Um, I can't 90, remember. 90. I can no. remember the circumstances, but I can't remember yeah. the year. Yeah, exactly. But but anyway, it was kind of around that time. And what what led me to think of that was that then a lot of these guys I kind of subsequently discovered had all kind of already died. Um, so I, I you know I discovered Albert King after he died. I think he was ninety two or ninety three. He died. Um, Albert Collins was around the same period. I think ninety two to ninety three. He died. So. I kind of discovered all these guys and I felt um I felt almost disappointed because I just missed them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was only BB <laughs> King. I mean, yeah, like, yeah, okay, Robert Cray still about. But you know what I mean? It's, yeah, of course. It's quite interesting that. I mean I yeah, that's interesting because I, I mean I got I got deeply into Jimi Hendrix after he died, obviously, because mm. well, you know I'm a bit older than you, but I could have been into him while he was still alive, but I didn't even know he right. existed. Right. Because obviously, then it's not. It's not until because I was living in Cornwall, so it was like it was only mm. what was on the radio. So it wasn't really. It wasn't a massive amount of Jimi Hendrix on the radio. Yeah. Um, 
so it wasn't really until I came back up here that um, I started getting influenced by stuff like that. But interestingly, maybe the fact that they're not there anymore gives them some sort of more, weirdly, some sort of cachet somehow. You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. they're not going to get any. They're not going to get any better, and they're not going to get any worse. You see what I mean? No. Yeah. Exactly. Um, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. You've got this sort of blues thing developing there, right? So, yeah. obviously, when did you... Because that's quite early on, really, for guitar, isn't it? Nine. Because it's 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 a diff, it's difficult for kids lo younger than that to, to learn guitar unless they've got a particular aptitude and focus, which is actually quite difficult I think, for a lot I of th kids. I th yeah, I think you're right. And I think also, yeah, it is... It's funny because I think guitar... Guitar is one of those instruments that a lot of people can kind of dabble with and can mm. maybe play a chord or two, as opposed mm. to something like the violin, which most of us mm. sound horrendous on if we've never played it. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You know what I mean? Also it's like, with the violin, because you can play a melody on a violin, well, you know, as long as you be in tune. <laughs> but <laughs> it's like you can sort of get something happening when you're quite young. Even if it's slightly out of tune, whereas, okay, if you're playing a load of melody stuff on the guitar, then that's okay. But, of course, that's not quite really what happens, is it, with guitar, and it becomes quite a, quite a challenge for a lot of kids, I think. So, you know, you know, so it's quite a young age, really, to start, and you'd already, you know. So how quickly do you feel that you, and this is always difficult when you, you look back on your own life, because mm. I, 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 I do, it's just... Because I think as a player, you never really like, you know, I don't think you ever think you're actually any good. <laughs> it's only other people just say, totally oh. true, isn't it? Because you're only, only seeing yeah. your, own, your own mistakes. You're very much in it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. So w when was it that you, you really sort of thought, oh, hang on, you know, I, I can do this. And this is something that, that sort of, when was that? Um, Did you have that sort of I think, I'm still, I think I'm still trying to get there, Vic, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, so for some people, it <laughs> yeah, is that sort of thing that you're always funny, wrestling, yeah. wrestling with something, aren't you? But... It, exactly, yeah. But no, no, I mean, I guess I... Yeah, so I started age nine. I think I really... got. I had a, re I had a really good teacher early on who really yeah. um, was... I mean, you know, was like I was learning in school. The lessons were 20 minutes, so you basically got in there. By the time you got it tuned up, you played a couple of chords, and then that was it. Yeah, yeah, and they were out, yeah. But yeah, exactly. But um, this guy who was, was um, who was who was, it, was a name? guy called Phil Rosenberg. Um, so oh, this right. was in okay. Somerset. This was in Crookern in Somerset. Oh right, yeah, I know Crookern. Um, yeah, um, and yeah, so he was he was just really enthusiastic, and mm. so he really enthused me. But I think I I kind of didn't really get the bug for it until I was probably um, fifteen, sixteen. That's when yeah. I really. And I was, I, you know, I was playing all that time, but I, yeah, I think it really, it really started to become something that I thought, I think uh, this is something I want to do potentially for the rest of my life kind of thing. Mm. Um, so, so what was that moment? Because I think this is quite a pivotal thing, actually, because <clears throat> there's lots of, you know, because obviously I'm interviewing lots of people about, you know, about things like that. And there are these pivotal moments where, you may have been doing a lot of stuff beforehand, but it was almost like, you know, the fact that you were enthused by this guy, even though it didn't mean that it was like, right, now I'm going to do this thing, you know, right? But it yeah. gives you that level of and, and being able to see somebody doing that as a job. Yeah. Unconsciously makes you realise that that's, that's a possibility. You yeah. don't necessarily yeah. make that connection consciously. But it's all there in the background, but that's a possibility. So this pivotal moment when you're saying you're about 15, what is it that, that you sort of look back on and go, yeah, there was this moment or this happened or was there something like that? Or Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I've never really thought about it, to be honest, but... Um... So I, yeah, I had, I had lessons there and then I, I can't remember what age I was. I actually switched to lessons outside school with another guy called Tom Toomey. And that, it was at that point that I um, really, yeah, really kind of got into it. So a, a lot of credit goes to, to Tom as well in terms of, 
you know, he really kind of picked up the blues thing with me that this guy Phil Rosenberg had sort of installed yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in a sense. And, uh, you know, he had me playing like really stretchy bar chord things early on. And because I was nine, it was great because that really helped me that, you know, yeah. my fingers were still growing and everything was still stretching. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, you know, I developed a good ability to do things like that on the instrument. But, um, yeah, that's a good point. I think, I think I'd probably if I'm trying to think on the spots, I think probably Stevie Ray Vaughan for me was quite a pivotal kind of influence in terms of really getting me into it. <laughs> I think when I heard his playing, so I think it was funnily enough, I'm trying to remember if it was that there, there was a, uh, well, I learned to drive when I was, when I was 17, as soon as I could. And um, my driving instructor played me um, live alive, which was uh it was, uh, and I, I think it was from the Montreux Jazz Festival, um, and it was because he. I think he played that twice. Stevie Ray did it in eighty two and eighty five. I think it was, and this was the the eighty five one. But he played me that. He played me Texas Flood from um, from that album, and um, that was just amazing. But I must have heard Stevie Ray before that. But I think certainly around that time, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. I probably heard Stevie Ray and I just really dug that playing. I remember trying to learn scuttle button with, uh, yeah, yeah, with yeah, Tom yeah. to me, um, <laughs> try, trying to, yeah, trying yeah. to learn. Yeah. Which, um, yeah, yeah know, took a few just, years. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. Well, it's one of those songs you sort of think, well, that's pretty straightforward. It's a blues. And then you sort of think, yeah, because it's and not you look it's, at the tempo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the intensity of the playing. It's just ridiculous. It is, yeah, but yeah, that yeah. was you know that was him all over, wasn't it? That was the thing yes, he had. The, yeah. totally. That was his. Yeah, yeah. That was his real gift, I think. He, uh, Stevie Ray he had the, he had the the fire and he had the passion, but he also had the technique, and uh, that, yeah, it yeah. was a brilliant, brilliant marriage of all those things. I think, which um, yeah, yeah which you know, th there are other guys that I mean, I suppose it's subjective in a way, but I I always thought Gary Moore had that as well, even though he's oh, a very God, different yes. player. But, oh my you God! Know, yeah. um, Coming, coming from the you know more more of the kind of the shred world, but um, yeah. but he just he, yeah he just he could play. There was lots of passion and soul in his playing as well, and that came through however fast or slow he was playing. I think yeah, so, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it is it's hard to pinpoint it, but I think around that time it was probably hearing his playing, and that really got me into it. And then I got into my first band, which was a band at school, and. Yeah, I think I just um, from there it kind of escalated, and I, I, um, I just want had to do it. I just had to play. I had to go home every day and pick up the guitar. You know, how much would you have said that is something about identity? Because in a way, when you look at Stevie Ray's playing, mm. there's an identity there, a little bit like Jeff Beck. You know, mm. They, mm. they are what they play. If you get my meaning, yeah, Whereas, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I could look at somebody like Joe Bonamassa and it's like, well, it's like, it's like sort of, well, he is a bit of a schizophrenic, you know what I mean? He he, he can he sound like this and he can sound like, you know, he can sound like Kossoff and he can say, you know, it's like, but, mm. but when you listen to certain players, it's them. And it's, you know, it's, you know what I mean? So there's a, that sort of thing that mm. also when you're playing in a band that, that thing about people look at you and you're now different from the people who are out there watching you. You know, it's like you've now got your own identity. You, you see what I mean? Mm, so I, think yeah. that's a, I think that's an important aspect of creativity. It's when you suddenly <laughs> realise that being musical or being artistic is not something that you do. It is something that you sort of are. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that gets completely missed out in the way that we think about this, particularly with, like, with education. It, it's, you know, it's like you can just yeah. own these things. Well, no, you don't own them. They own you in a way. They, you are part of that. And I'm just yeah. wondering how much of that, how much of that is <clears throat> what happens, you know, did that, I don't know, it's difficult yeah. to sort of put you on the spot. And I know, Often when, you know, it's, you don't think of those things intellectually. It's just, there are sort of those pivotal moments that just sort of happen. It's, but I think they're important. That's what I'm yeah. sort of getting at. Yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely. And I mean, I completely wholeheartedly agree with that. I mean, and it, 
you know, it does it does sort of it does sort of own you in a way the music because uh, yeah, I mean, I'm ashamed to say it, and I'm I, I wish I had a better handle on it at times, but if I'm not happy with my playing, then I'm not necessarily happy. If I'm happy with my playing, I'm generally happy. <laughs> uh, um, us, that's brilliant. Quite, that's brilliant. <laughs> because, again, that's one of those... It, it is totally what we what was saying about that, thing about mm. personality. Um, there's a little story about Robin Ford, right? Mm. Love I, Robin Ford. Massive influence on me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I studied NLP, you know, the sort of psych- this psychological stuff. Um, and I learned with Richard Bandler. And Bandler knew, because he lived, you know, he was in America and he was friends with Jerry Garcia and all these sort of guys. Right. Um, and he was all in that, that sort of area of that, you know, that sort of musical thing and, you know, the 60s stuff. Yeah. And he said that he met this young lad and uh, he said he was just, this guy played guitar and he said he, he was the best thing I'd ever heard. And he was a young lad called Robin Ford. And he, and, and he said, because he was interested in how this, you know, what mentally was going on with mm. this guy. And he said to, to him, how do you feel when you play? And Robin Ford turned around to him and he said, well, when I play the guitar, everything's, I think he said something like, the world is a better place. Wow. You know, something like that. It was that sort of thing that I, I feel good inside myself. Mm. And, and because that really, a bit like what you're saying, but flipped around, you know, if, if you're not playing well, it's like nothing's actually going right. It's a very yeah. similar thing, isn't it? It's a, it, it's a very similar thing, how that reflects out in your, in, in your playing. And it's, it's your personality. Definitely, definitely. And I uh, absolutely. And I, I think um, what I was going to add to that as well is that and I think this is something I've only arrived at more kind of latterly. So, yeah, so I started playing when I was nine. I'm 40 now. So that's 31 years. If the maths is right. Um, and I think probably, yeah, only in the last 10 years I've really connected with, yeah, particularly the guitar and but music as a whole as like to be a reflection of um yeah my personality and I think I've I've got to the point where I've played long enough and I've done enough practice that I can and I'm familiar enough with musical ideas that I can use certain things to express how I'm feeling or or to paint a picture of a certain thing you know um and and, and I really enjoy that I really like that and that and that, and that gives me the opportunity to really bring my personality and how I'm feeling out on my instrument, um, which feels incredible to be able to do, um, because that's that's definitely definitely not something everybody has. So yeah. I feel incredibly lucky to to have that, and and yeah, it's it's amazing to be able to play in that sense. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. So. You got we got to the thing you're in a band at school. Did what, what I'm saying? Did you, did you go to music college or something? Did you... I did, yeah. So I so I um I went to do I studied a B tech in pop music. So it wasn't sort of specifically guitar at that point, it was just music in general. So we did all sorts of stuff. We did kind of we looked at various prog tracks, we looked at orchestral stuff. Mm-hmm. Um but I obviously I was massively into the blues, so that was a, a common theme that was running through all of that for me in terms of I started a little band uh, at, at college. It was just a three-piece, and yeah, I was playing BB King, Stevie Ray kind of stuff, all that, all the stuff I was into, really, Albert Collins stuff. Um, and yeah, so I did that for two years, um, and um, yeah, that was at, that was at Yeovil College, um, which is in Somerset as well. Um, and then yeah, after that, I then continued to study and did another three years. Um, in kind of musical education. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, so So you're not down in you're not you're not down in the West Country, are you? No, I'm I'm uh out in Hampshire these days. Right. Uh, not right. far from Stonehenge. <laughs> oh right, okay. So it's still yeah, still yeah. a fair yeah, yeah, okay. Um Yeah, still. So so with that then, did you when because this is always <laughs> one of the thorny questions, really, is like when when you did you finish that musical education? 
what came I next? Did. Yeah. So yeah. what came next? Did you just go straight back in? Did you get into teaching or did you go and do something else? I did. So I, I, I guess I sort of picked up some things along the way. So, so I ended up, after I'd been to Yeovil College, I actually went to the Academy of Contemporary Music in Guildford, the ACM. Right, and, okay, um, right, okay. Yeah, oh. and, um, and funnily enough, I never really left because I still teach there now. That's where I oh, ended up. Right. Um, that's where I ended up teaching. So I've been there for yeah, 21, 21 years this year. I've been oh. kind of involved involved in that in some way. So I I did a, a year course, um, a higher diploma as it as it was mm. back then. And then I did a two-year degree, which was like an accelerated program, and that was all at the ACM. Um, but during that time, I again I started my own um group when I got to Guildford, which again was largely started as a three piece. And then um, I kind of added keyboards at some point. Um, and, uh, and, and then I, yeah, I got into playing um, function band work in my first year of the degree, which was something that then I did for, I mean, I still do the occasional one now, but I did it for a good, probably, yeah. Um, 15, 15 years. Mm. Um, which was actually brilliant because it really helped me musically with, developing my ability in a range of styles and also um I was really fortunate that I the first function band I joined was well established I then joined another function band which was also well established so I got to travel to some really great places the, the first mm. abroad gig I ever did was in Beirut <laughs> right which is quite an, quite an unusual um place for your first uh, abroad gig I guess absolutely but, yeah um but um yeah so so I kind of once I start, once I made the decision to kind of go into music, I guess I, yeah, I've never really left it in the sense that I, I went into musical education. I then literally started teaching while I was still studying at the ACM. Um, one of my tutors there, a guy called Andy Jones, um, he used to get me to cover for him. Um, if he had to go off and uh, do a gig or whatever, he'd get me to cover the last part of his class. And then a friend of mine, who was teaching there moved back up um, to um, Hebden Bridge, so North Yorkshire. Oh, right, and, in Yorkshire, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then um, and he put me forward for his hours. So that was, I think, wow. roughly two thousand and five or something. Mm. And so, um, yeah, so I ended up I ended up kind of staying there, really. <laughs> You're right. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's again. That's that's sort of a confirmation, isn't it, of of what you you could do um, that that people put you into those those sort of places you know that they i guess so yeah cover. and of course <clears throat> yeah here's an interesting thing as well i think the best way to actually really solidify what you know is by teaching other people isn't it true because suddenly all those things that you do you have to explain to somebody else and it goes, it goes <laughs> yeah. through a process of because and it's funny because that's i was talking to <clears throat> Somebody who's um, a lecturer in well uh, in literature, um, and okay. he said the same thing. He said, "If you want to, if you want to learn something, teach it." <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, I thought, yeah. well, yeah, it's absolutely true. Um, so I think that's that's quite an important thing, and it's also sharing information isn't it? with others. Um, I think that's, that's something I think is really important. Giving that sort of thing of giving something back. Um, definitely definitely and I think those are you know those those days when I'm teaching and I can um really uh I, I really see that I've helped to um help someone to kind of realize something and get something it's it's a great it's a great feeling when you see that that, that light yeah, bulb is. you know go yeah. off and you you realize that you've kind of been a part of that and then you you kind of watch that develop and you see the person um, you know, take that forward in their own way or something. It's yeah, it's, um, it's incredible, isn't it? That's an incredible experience. In fact, I've never, never actually discussed this on 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 a podcast. That thing about seeing somebody who's a pupil become this something that you know it's not you doing it. That's the thing, but you're part of yeah, the process no. of of them arriving at that. Thing. Definitely. Um, I mean, they do. They do. They do all the hard work in the sense. Oh God, you don't the, you do know, it. Yeah, no, the I mean, it's, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But again, it's that <laughs> thing you were saying about that sort of spark. 
You were saying about yes, the, exactly. that early teacher, you know, that, that gives you Planting that sort the seed. of... Yeah. Yeah, it gives you that enthusiasm to, to, exactly. to do that. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Definitely. So, yeah. so the function band thing, I mean, yeah, yeah, they're good for a while, aren't they? I must say, I, I, I can't. <laughs> I can't do that stuff <laughs> anymore. Just, just I can't cope with it. But um, but that, yeah, it's a good experience, isn't it? Definitely. De- definitely. I mean, I think I, the first one I joined uh, um, was a friend of mine called Marco Manaconi, who was the guy I mentioned who lives up in um, North Yorkshire now. And he, um, yeah, he basically got me got me involved in it. And he was a he was a mate of mine already. <clears throat> and then I think I think I've you know I've been. I've been quite fortunate in terms of a lot of the gigs I've ended up on. I've, I mean, I suppose it's probably not uncommon, but I've ended up being on them with people that I really get along well with, which yes. isn't always isn't always the case. Um, no. But like, for example, this this first function band, um, you know, I was in it for a good number of years, and all the people in it became really close friends, and we used to, you know, we'd hang out. With how we mostly lived in Guildford, all of us, which is where the ACM is, um, mm. and we um, so we just used to hang out all the time. Go, so, you know, go, have dinner around each other's houses, go out drinking or whatever. And um, and then the second band I got into, which was a band called E Two, they most of the guys oh, yeah, yeah, were, yeah. Based, okay. were, yeah. were based in Kent. Yeah, and because yeah, um, yeah. um, obviously Tom, and, Tom, Tom Knights. Of course, yeah. That's yeah. that's that's kind of how I first met Tom. I think, yeah. Um, Exactly, but that, again, I did that for so long. They all became great mates, and again, we, you know, you you know how it is when you you know you're you're working gigs. You the the kind of the part of the time where you're actually playing is usually the smallest part of it. The rest yeah. of the time, you're oh, hang, you're yeah. hanging yeah. out. So, yeah. so so you you know you um you and when you're doing that with these people a lot, you know, you get to know them and you you become you become close friends. So. Um, so I really enjoyed that part of it as well. And then the added benefit of getting to travel and, you know, I was doing a lot of this in my twenties, so I was sort of fairly carefree and <laughs> just kind of enjoying myself and not too many worries. And, uh, so, uh, it was, it was a great time to be able to do that and to travel around and, um, all over Europe and parts of the Middle East. And so it was great. Mm-hmm. That's, that's amazing. That's really cool. Um, yeah, so that's, that's always interesting, uh, the, the sort of cross-referencing of, you know, you mentioning bands, and of course, I know a few people from those, uh, those yeah. bands, you know. Um, and of course, that networking thing is like really important. And and this, again, this is something actually that's come up a couple of times. Um, I was talking to um, to Josh Ferrara um, a few a couple of years ago, actually, and because he was talking about. We were just talking about college stuff, you know. And you were saying about how ridiculous the the thing about networking was, you know, like they they instead of just going, Well, look, you just gotta go out and have a drink with people and just don't, <laughs> yeah. you know, don't be a dick type of thing, you know, just just be nice and because that's what you're saying. You know, when you were saying about being in bands with people that you actually get on with and you actually know, mm. that is the way mm. that people get in. And it's actually quite difficult to get in into a band on a sort of an audition basis where nobody knows you. It's actually really difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think it's difficult. And I, a couple of people have said, you know, like, um, I'm talking to some people who were saying that, you know, they, they took, took them ages to get into something and they were like incredible bass players and stuff like that. But again, mm. the way they got in was they... <clears throat> There was a drummer that need you know there was a bass player dropped out of a band and the he the drummer knew and he you know and he got into the band and so on. You think we had it? It is all about networking. It's all about people and it because bands are it's all about chemistry anyway, isn't it? When you see a great definitely, band. absolutely, yeah. And I mean, it's it's interesting to think about that, isn't it? Because I think what you've just mentioned there, you know, like a bassist who's in you know an incredible player but maybe isn't isn't getting any gigs and then a drummer friend needs a a, a depth in their band or whatever and that's kind of how they get the, their foot in the door uh, so to speak um and and it's it's funny to think about that and reflect how often you know you it's kind of about i think 
being a likable character is very much in your favour. Oh my god, so, I think it's absolutely the cornerstone of it because if you if you just because otherwise you're not going to get any gigs. Yeah. Well, you well you might get one. Yeah. And then then you won't get another one. <laughs> and it seems quite exactly. interesting that you know because I think there's there's also that this idea that somebody can be a diva, and you go like, no, mm. you can't be. You just have to be really easy to get on with. And it's, it is all mm. about the chemistry of a band. And um, and that's the thing, I think, you know, it's another thing, I, like I encourage like a lot of the kids that I work with, well, not even, you know, teenagers and all, so, that when they get that sort of thing, you know, you go, well, hang on a minute. You, you've got to be organised. If you're not organised, you're going to have a problem, right? If you can't turn up on time, you haven't got the gear and all the rest of it and you haven't prepped up, then you've got a problem. And the other thing is, if you're surly or whatever, then you've got a problem with that and all. Um, and that's yeah. regardless of how good you are, because exactly, it just it just doesn't <laughs> just doesn't work. No, um, no, and we both exactly, exactly. I was going to say, I'm sure we both know those examples of, and we may have been in those positions ourselves, where we're we're putting a band together, or we know someone who's putting a band together, and the the um you know it's it's perhaps it's easier to go with a player who might not necessarily be as good but they're not perhaps oh, going to give you the grief. <laughs> I totally agree yeah. with you. Now it's interestingly though, I mean you know with the when you're doing like the ACM stuff, I mean, does that really come out as part of the syllabus that it's you know, or is it just about because those things I think mm. are actually fundamental in like forming yeah. up bands and yet it's not it's sort of like blindingly obvious but it's so obvious that you don't think about it until you realize that actually that's not working because of this thing you know um and and likewise i can't imagine how that would fit into a syllabus how you would talk about no because if they're not I mean... doing it with networking this is the thing i was getting at if the networking mm. thing was like, you can't, you know, get your business card and you do this or whatever it is, you know, and you do your, your social media and whatever, it's been like, nobody's really interested in that. Nobody's really interested in in you from that perspective. But they're interested mm. in, in that if, you know, you're, you're a nice guy and or whatever, you know, girl or whatever, and you're funny and you're easy to get on with and, and all the rest of it, you know, and they think about what, you know, they're care you're careful about other people and all the rest of it. I think that's that's really important. So there we go. You know, because I've always I've always done things from forming bands. That's always been my thing, mm -hmm. and that's always been the thing for me. That I will pick somebody that I know. You know, I've got the choice of loads of guitar players, but I'll pick somebody who knows knows how I play. Mm. If they're you know they're playing second guitar. And it's somebody I know I can, they get on with everybody else. Yeah. You know, certainly in preference to their ability to, you know, you can have somebody else who's a great, great player and you think, no, no, they're just, that does, they're not the person for that. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think that, I think that goes back to actually what you mentioned, Vic, about the personality thing earlier on. Mm. And um, how then, you know, when you're, I guess one way to think about it is when you're together in a band and you're creating music, it's a coming together of all those personalities, isn't it? And yeah, therefore, okay, yeah, yeah. It's all a chemistry. And because, yeah. yeah. And you've probably been in a band where you've got like an incredible array of players and it just doesn't <clears throat> function properly. Yeah, yeah. And that is Certainly. so weird, isn't it? Because on it paper... Is, it's like, a, I was yeah. In, you know, I was in a band that, the, the the guys who'd work with people like you know like bands like Uriah Heep and mm. <laughs> you know they had you know they had involvement with bands like um, uh, Motorhead and all the rest of it. like real right. real and individually they were great but collectively mm. it was a non-starter it was incredible you know it's funny so, and you could reel off the names of these you know somebody who'd worked <laughs> with Susie Quattro and it was mm. like and you think, why didn't that work? But it was just, there was just something not right. It was... No. Just and didn't it's, work. It's, yeah. And it's it's almost like, I mean, I suppose I can use that word. It's almost like part of the, you know, the magic 
of it is that it because it's, re- yeah. it's really hard to it's really hard to kind of quantify what what it is that yeah. makes yeah. that it, work, yeah, isn't it? Right. It's well, like it's that sort of central thing that happens with art, anyway, isn't it? It's like you, you go and see mm. a great painting, you look at it and you go, "I," it just does something to me, and I don't yeah. know what that is. And and it, it's that type of thing that you put a group of people together, and it just happens or it doesn't. And it's always the mm. same with like if you get a group of mates to go out for a drink, you know, yeah. it's the same thing, isn't it? You can get a group of people, and it's just just amazing. And then you can get a group of people and one person's a little bit sort of, you know, a little bit sort of prickly in certain situations with certain people. And But again, then there's nothing wrong with that person. It's just there's something mm. not quite... And sometimes that works within a band anyway, but I'm just sort of, you know... But I think that, exactly. sort, of, that sort of chemistry thing is, like, really, really important, really. So what... Um, I mean, what, who, who are you sort of working with at the moment, because I, you know, I know the few things that you do, but um, maybe you can say. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. So, I mean, so I've I've been playing with a um, a singer called Joe Harmon for. Yeah, she's uh, got a lovely the, voice, hasn't she? Yeah, she's wicked, Fabulous. and she's become a you know, and she's become a very close friend as yeah. well. Um, um, and so that was 2014. I started playing with her, and then she's actually just. Um, about to have twins <laughs> yeah so she's taking a bit of a bit of a break um yeah. but um so yes i've been doing that gig for yeah about nine years and um that's been fantastic and that for me as well that's been a, a real a really positive experience in terms of um i don't really like like streamline streamlining and kind of tailoring my playing and and, and um kind of in the in the sort of session session musician mentality side of things, like there's 101 things I could play here, but the the right thing to play would be this, you know. And um, mm. um, so so yeah, that's been that's been kind of a mainstay. And then about well, coming up for two years ago, I started depping with Toya Wilcox. And, oh right, um, oh okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, competing so, with um, Robert Fripp then. Wonderful. That's it. Well, we've just, <laughs> funny enough, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. Um, <laughs> some rather large shoes to fill, <laughs> obviously. But um, we um, we yeah, just exactly. started doing some, we just started doing some gigs with Rip as well, which is amazing. Yeah. And we did a yeah, couple, couple weekends yeah. ago, and um, and then so we've got a tour in October. Um, I don't know if you know they do the Sunday lunch. Um, yeah, yeah, I've seen the Sunday lunch is yeah, in lockdown. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, they're brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, oh, so they're basically basically touring that but um yeah and that's um you know that's that's a a, a completely different experience as a gig in comparison oh, to joe for example oh my god i could imagine um if i saw music again i saw when i, I saw toya Wilcox when she first became you know she was sort, of, sort of appeared on the scene mm. and uh, i've never seen anything like it i've never seen anybody move around a stage like that because it yeah, was just it's got lots of great energy. Oh my god! I mean, this was just like, well, it was like, well, uh, the nearest I, I would say was like it was Mick Jagger di- dialed up to ten. I was unbelievable. <laughs> so I mean, she, she's still completely out there, isn't she? I mean, even now, she's amazing. She's um, she's amazing. She's um, she'll be. She'll be sixty-five this year, I think it is. Sixty-four, sixty-five. <laughs> she won't, she won't, she won't mind me saying it because she says, she always says it on the gigs. Well, she looks but pretty I'm, good for that. I must say, she looks very good. But she's um, her work ethic is incredible, and she's a real inspiration to work for. She's she's lovely as well. She's a, she's a lovely person, very really genuine. And um, but um, yeah, just her work ethic is you know it kind of rubs off. It's fantastic, and she's obviously had a big career in acting as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, does she does motivational speaking? She does all sorts of things. So, um, yeah. oh, that's you know the, how. Yeah, so it's it's great, and obviously it's amazing to be up on the, the stage with with Robert Fripp as well. Um, yeah. and uh, so yeah, so that's that's, that's good a very enjoyable experience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> indeed it does. <laughs> no, that's absolutely amazing. Fantastic. No, I mean, I mean, he's another person that you could sort of think, well, this this chap's working in another sort of a parallel universe. I mean, extraordinary guy. 
amazing yeah it's totally amazing and like um you know just incredible how and again it, it, it you know it goes back again to that personality thing or how when when you look at, at Fripp and you see kind of how immersed immersed in it he's been how it's so um it's been his life you know that King Crimson thing it's it's been it's been his his life and it just so uh there, there was a documentary that he he did recently that that came out and um oh, I think okay. they filmed a, a, they filmed a fair bit of it when they were over in Japan King Crimson fairly recently and um and yeah he's just uh, just the you know his his intent and his um the importance of the music is is tangible you know yes um, oh my god yes when, yeah, when yeah. you hear him talk about it it's just it's amazing well, um, well it comes out of that, it comes out of that sort of like that sort of stable of musicians like you know like brian eno right yeah because oh, they, they did a lot of stuff together anyway didn't yeah. they but um but sort of brian eno and robert fripp and, and obviously bowie and all that sort of stuff where music becomes mm. this sort of doorway to just exploring all sorts of extraordinary things about how everything sort of ticks it's extraordinary amazing um, mm. you know there's this sort of psychological aspect of it putting it sort of it's deep yeah it's really deep. incredibly deep yeah i know yeah amazing you know, it's an extraordinary experience well i'll have to check that that out actually in that documentary um yeah no it's 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 amazing well worth checking yeah. out definitely i forget the name of it actually um i can't remember the name of it but it's um, it only came out recently so it'll obviously be um it will be King Crimson and uh, and Robert Fripp in the title somewhere for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, brilliant stuff. Yeah, it's great. So, what you know, what um, you got these these things? What other anything else? Do you um, doing anything yeah, of your I mean, own, or you just you know you? I I am yeah. So I've I've kind of probably like like most people, I've got a bit of a a, a love hate relationship with my own stuff. I don't know. When, maybe I'm uh, I'm generalising there, but I know that you know. Um, uh, sometimes you enjoy your own stuff more than other times. Um, mm, again, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for, for me, that again, that's kind of dependent on my relationship with the with, almost with music as a whole at the time. But um, but yeah, I am writing stuff. Um, I've got some tracks that I've done recently with um, a drummer friend of mine called Sean Kane. Who I don't know if you've come across. Oh, Sean. He's that's, based a name, in, that's yeah, it's a name that rings a bell, but I don't. Right, He's based in Kent. He's done a lot of. He actually we met through um, E2 again, the function band. Mm. So, mm. Um, but um, yeah, so we've been doing some stuff and uh, like remotely. So we, mm. uh, I think we started originally doing some stuff in one of the lockdowns, and then everything unlocked and we got kind of really busy again. And uh, mm. and so it kind of went on the back burner. But more recently, we've started doing some stuff again. So that's that's instrumental stuff. Mm. Um, the stuff I did previously was um, vocal stuff where I was singing, but um, I've never quite been able to um, kind of calibrate myself with the whole singing thing to the point where I think it's I'm I'm happy enough with it as a lead vocal thing to to keep doing it. If you know what I mean, it's a, it's a strange one, but um, so I can sing, but it's I don't think it's ever going to be good enough to my ears to be. <laughs> what the you know kind of the lead vocal part so i'm doing instrumental stuff and um but yeah that's we're, we're kind of working on that slowly but surely um and so there will definitely be some stuff at some point but um it's kind of it keeps getting picked up and put down again which sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. seems to be the nature of these things but yeah you good because you i know you put a lot of stuff up on instagram don't you like a yeah sort of little riff and lick stuff. ideas and stuff yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, so um, that's, yeah, I'm constantly kind of, you know, putting those things out. And I'm just, uh, you know, I'm in the process of picking up a few of those and working mm. on um, developing those more into into songs as well. But, mm. but yeah, that, that that's become a little outlet for me. It first became actually, an that's quite Actually, that's a good, quite a good thing to do, actually, isn't it? Just sort of like mm. putting an idea out there that, you know, like on, like on some sort of short thing, whether it's TikTok or, or Instagram or whatever. Yeah. Because I'm just, I just finished doing a book, um, and it started off mm. as a load of little blog posts. So it's right. the sort of thing, you know, of 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 getting things out, and then having to redo them, and and then gradually over a period of time, like years, I must say, God, ten years probably, it becomes something that you could, you know, just, and then that might be that might be a really interesting way of using that sort of technology. 
you know. Definitely. And I think it's um it, it's certainly been, you know, even just doing those kind of the lick of the day things, which yeah. I do on Instagram and, and Facebook, it's um it's led to a, a few gigs, people giving yeah. me a shout and asking me for gigs. Yeah. It's led led to a um uh led to a few collaboration kind of things as well. So it's yeah. it's um which I you know that uh, in all honesty that wasn't the the reason for doing it to start with it was just it was during lockdown and it was like this is just going to be my outlet which I think a lot of people probably ended up doing stuff like that um you know yeah. whether it's gigs online or whatever it was yeah. just my way of keeping that creativity going when the gigs had completely dried up and everything else had dried up for all of us really so yeah <laughs> I know <laughs> <laughs> well you know I, I, I've been doing this well before lockdown i mean i've been doing this about mm. four or five years um but obviously what was great about lockdown is that people couldn't escape <laughs> because yeah. they couldn't say, oh um I'm, I'm, because it's like no i'm in the house and uh, so i managed to pick up a couple of really good interviews uh, with uh, with people that just couldn't you know they, not, they weren't doing anything so it was great it's good fun so yeah. you know there's brings- a silver lining isn't there there Every is indeed. Cloud, so, yeah, it it, it brings to mind that um it brings to mind that saying um we uh, you know I've had to suffer for my art and so now you have to suffer as well. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly, I've, yeah. Exactly. I've yeah. had to suffer for my art. Now you definitely have to suffer because you haven't got anywhere to go. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You cannot escape brilliant stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's great. Well, well, thanks now. That was that was brilliant. Really good. And, uh, and some really really some, no, it's great. It's really interesting um, points there. I mean so I'm doing this as a, you know, for people to just sort of explore things. Um, and Because actually mm. there seems to be a bit of a vibe appearing now about this thing about creativity. Because Rick Rubin has just released a book, which is actually almost the same as mine. But unfortunately, he's got there before right. me, which is a bit of a bummer. <laughs> um, you know, it's a bit sort of left field, you know, and I'm thinking, well, okay, but. At least that's that might be a good vibe anyway. So, but I think there actually a lot of people are interested in 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 what is what what is going on with this sort of creative process, but not as a set of instructions. You know, it's like because you can't pin it down, can you? You know, but if you listen to people's stories, I think it inspires people um, to do things yeah. for themselves. Yeah. yeah, brilliant stuff. All right. So Definitely. if you send me some All stuff right. for the show notes, um, you know, like website addresses or whatever that'd be really cool and i'll put them up so cool. people can track down what you're doing you know what your instagram is all right definitely and then, uh, yeah. yeah brilliant stuff all right well thanks ever so all much right. for your time Matt. brilliant thank you very thanks for having lovely me. turn cheers no, it's been great fun thank you mm-hmm.